All right, good morning, everyone. As the final few of you log on this morning, I am going to just get started with some housekeeping items. Um, welcome everyone to Lumsden McCormick's annual Exempt Organizations Conference. My name is Christine Prugjib, and I will be serving as your host for this webinar. Before we get to introductions, I'm going to run through several housekeeping items. First, this webinar will be recorded and once available, we will post it to the Lumsden McCormick website. In addition, a link to the slide deck will be provided for those presentations that we are permitted to share. Both the chat and Q&A features are enabled. Please make sure to add your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box. We will be answering questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. We are offering one hour of CPE credit for each webinar. Therefore, you will need to answer all polling questions. We will have four polling questions that appear throughout the presentation. CPE certificates will be emailed from support at prolera.com within 30 days, and the subject line will read Lumsden McCormick CPE certificate. At the end of the webinar, please complete the webinar survey, which will automatically launch. The survey will serve as the webinar evaluation and it is required for CPE credit. Additionally, um, the Prolera email you receive will also contain a webinar evaluation. This one is optional to complete. However, we always appreciate any feedback you have. And also for future webinars, both today and tomorrow, please remember to log in using your full name for both first and last in Zoom. Any questions related to housekeeping items, please send me a message in the chat. Now, moving on to our webinar. We are happy to welcome back to the virtual Lumsden McCormick stage today, Fred Floss. Fred is the chairperson of the Department of Economics and Finance and professor of economics and finance at Buffalo State College, where he teaches courses in both economics and finance. He is a senior fellow at the Fiscal Policy Institute, where he was their third executive director. Fred has published numerous articles and is active in the Buffalo community. You can see Fred's full bio on the conference page on our website. Now, Fred, I will turn everything over to you. Thank you, Christine. This is great uh, to uh, have a chance to come back and talk to everyone. Uh, just as a, a matter of, of introduction, um, economists have been a little bit confused about what was going to happen uh, after COVID. And you can see uh, on all of the newspapers, whether it's former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, or Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman, or any number of economists trying to figure out uh, what, uh, what we think is going to happen and what we expected to happen. Um, what, before COVID, we were looking at uh, going into a recession, and most economists thought around 2019, 2020, that we would have a recession. We had gone from 2008, 2009, and the Great Recession of a very long time without having a recession. And we were starting to see uh, signs that a recession was going to start to take place. Particularly, we're starting people seeing they were losing their jobs. Um, the question then becomes, COVID happened. We didn't have a recession. And now we've come out of COVID and there was this expectation, if you listen to uh, Larry Summers about stagnation and what he meant by that was high inflation and high unemployment, much like what we had in the 1970s. We can see now that that hasn't happened. Or um, Paul Krugman, who was worrying that unemployment was going to be too high and that we needed more stimulus. So economists were all over uh, the map on what we would expect. And the big question that I'm interested in that I wanna to talk to you today about is what is this disconnect between the idea that the economy is terrible in the minds of consumer sentiment, of polling that we see, and the economic data that says 
inflation's coming down, employment's still low, and wages are growing. Um, is what? Why is that happening? Is it that across the country things look better, but in a place like Buffalo, things don't look very good? Or is there something else going on? So I'd like to walk to you through today some ideas, show you a little bit about what's happening in uh, Western New York, and hopefully have a bunch of time for questions on anything that you have. The first thing I, I just wanna make sure people realize is just how devastating COVID is and was. We've lost almost 4,000 people in Western New York. That's a large number uh, of individuals. And we've lost about 64, 65,000 people in New York State to COVID. And just to put that into perspective, that's the same size as the city of Utica. So it would be as if Utica was wiped off the map. So that should have had a dramatic impact on a lot of the numbers we, we see. Uh, and we're going to see that some of these things uh, aren't actually happening. Um, but the other thing I want to note is that we still have this year over 200 people dying of COVID. Uh, we think that all of this is over, but in fact, it's not. Um, now, we still have people dying of the flu and other diseases as well. So the vaccines and other things have started to work, but we still need to be careful. Uh, and I'm not sure that everybody is taking the same kind of concerns that maybe we should have. Um, so what do we know about 2020? Um, Buffalo and the rest of the world shut down. Many businesses have closed. We laid off workers. Uh, other workers were sent home. And that's going to be an interesting transition to watch over the next few years. Are people going to come back to the office to work? Or are we going to continue to have people uh, just work from home? Uh, we're hearing about hybrid work where people come in two or three times uh, a week, maybe, or once a month. Um, but that's going to have real implications, particularly for tax bases in Buffalo and other cities around the state, if all of a sudden property values in our downtown uh, areas uh, are dormant and the value of property goes down because people aren't coming to work. Um, but the reality of what happened was while that was going on and all of you were adjusting to how to keep your businesses open and how to go to work, the federal government learned from both the Great Depression and the Great Recession that they were going to need to act quickly and put money into the economy so that we didn't have another Great Recession. So they essentially put about $5.3 billion into the economy. But the most important thing, and I think this is going to be part of my answer on why people feel like they're not doing as well, is that individuals who are making up to $75,000, we're going to get $1,400, uh, basically just sent to them in a check. And if you were a family of four, you were going to get $2,800 if your family was making under $150,000. And then another $2,800 if you had two children. So we're looking at over $5,000. So if you start to think about it, that's a large amount of money for individuals to get in 2020 and, and 21. The other thing that was happening, and I know all of you are probably still working on some of the details of uh, putting all the paperwork in, is businesses were given funds to keep employees working. The whole idea of this was that in order to have a recession, if we closed down, nobody would buy anything. And if people didn't buy anything, there would be additional layoffs and we would spiral down into a, a, a recession or even worse, a depression. And because 
of the federal government pumping money into the economy, what they did was they stopped that spiraling down, but they also planted the seeds for inflation uh, as we look at what's going on. So uh, I guess our first polling question is coming up. Uh, and do you need CE or CPE credit? Okay, everyone, we'll give this just a moment while I see your responses coming in. Okay. And it does appear that most of you are here this morning to get those CPE credits. So let's just keep the show moving and back to you, Fred. Thank you. Um, but they've also done more than just um, uh, COVID relief. They also did the American Rescue Plan and infrastructure. So the economy has been seeing a large influx in money and it went to a large number of places. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but colleges and universities really did need the money to be able to get up and running uh, and keep students going to school. There were There's money that's going to local governments, which allowed them to keep workers uh, on the payroll and in some cases not have to raise taxes, which would have caused problems. So there was a lot of money being pumped into the economy to keep the economy going. And therefore we've at least postponed any version of a recession that we would think. And just to do a comparison between 1929 and 1933, manufacturing dropped 33% in the United States. And notice that we're looking basically at five years uh, of recession, sort of like the great uh, recession that we had, sorry, great depression. Uh, and unemployment rose to 25% and didn't come below 10% till 1941. So this is what the government was afraid of. Ben Bernanke, uh, who was running basically monetary policy his uh, specialty uh, in economics was the Great Depression. So he was sort of the right person at the right time. We'll see whether or not everything he did works out. But he was very, very concerned about us having a Great Depression. And so he and the Biden administration have both acted to try to minimize the harm with the idea that once COVID was over, they would have to come back and tighten monetary policy and maybe do some restrictions uh, on government spending to get us back into a balance that we still have, we're still not at. So let's talk about Buffalo. What happened to Buffalo? And let's look at wages. And I'll remind you about average wages and pointing out that if people are making a lot of money at the top, they're gonna pull the average wage up. So we can look at median wages, which are a little bit lower than these, but I have average wages here for both Buffalo and New York State. And the important thing to look at from 2020 is essentially that wages have been slowly but surely increasing. Now these are nominal wages and we wanna make sure if we look at this, that we take inflation into account because in real terms, we wanna make sure that people are doing better. And maybe part of the reason is while wages are going up, if inflation is um, even higher than that, then you're actually gonna be able to buy less and do that. But over the last three years, we've seen uh, wages go up by $10,000 in average on people. So let's look at what about inflation. Inflation is that gray line on the bottom. And you can see up until about 2014, 2015, Buffalo's wages were growing at the same rate as inflation. So for about 12, 15 years, 
people in Buffalo weren't seeing any real benefit to the wage increases. They were holding steady. And this has been a complaint that we've seen basically going back to the early um, 1990s that we haven't seen wages increase in real terms. Um, and I did this so that you could see exactly uh, what's happened to wages and inflation so you can compare them as opposed to putting them in real terms where it gets to be a little bit confusing. But what you can see is that with COVID in 2020, that that line slope changes that we see an even steeper increase in wages going up along with inflation. But if we look at this and we look at what's happened over the last 20 years, real wages have gone up by about 23% in Buffalo. So we talk about the Buffalo Renaissance, we're actually seeing it here in wages as we go along. So Buffalo's grown, um, New York State has grown as well. Most of that growth has happened in New York City. Um, but in both cases, we've grown at about the same rate. We're actually pretty carefully growing. We're a little bit below, but we started out a little bit lower. Um, so we are keeping up with the rest of the state and we're growing a lot faster. The question now is gonna be, will wages continue to grow faster than inflation with, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's our second polling question. Uh, did wages increase for your employees or for you uh, over COVID or since COVID? Thanks, Fred. We'll just give everyone a minute here. Okay, and I will share those results with everyone here. So that's actually good to see for Buffalo that people have seen wages that 81% of you increased individuals' wages. Um, that's, uh, I think, an important thing. And along with changes in the minimum wage and others, that's allowed people particularly at the lower end of the wage scale to see real growth. And that's really one of the questions that economists have. If we see this kind of wage growth, why aren't people happy? Why do they think that the economy is bad? And in fact, if you look at the polling, when you ask somebody, are you doing better? They say yes. Do you think the economy is doing better? They say no. So it's a little bit of a question that we're trying to sit down and figure out a little bit as we go through all of this. Well, maybe the question is that different people have different wages and some of the industries uh, in Western New York and in New York State are seeing different kinds of wage growth. And therefore, maybe some people aren't doing as well as others. I put this slide on simply to talk to you about a real problem that we're seeing uh, with individuals uh, talking about wages and employment because they get confused about averages and what medians and what it means. The median is 50% above and 50% below of individuals are there and it's a measure of central tendency. Averages, on the other hand, just add everything up and divide by the number of people. The problem with using averages is that if we have a few people who are making a large amount of money while everybody else is making a little bit of money, that um, they're going to skew the results. And the example here is looking at finance in New York State, which is really New York City, where you have a number of people making, you know, five, $10 million that pull that average up all out of proportion. Uh, from everybody else. And information to some extent 
is the same uh, with all of that. Uh, there's a great um, New York Times article by um, uh, Professor Krugman talking about this sort of problem in a different context where some uh, news outlets, basically business news outlets, were saying that wages grew faster in COVID and now they're slowing down. Well, the reality is what happened was more people in the middle income are coming back to work that weren't uh, at work or had lost their jobs. Their salaries were lower and therefore it looks like wages are growing slower. But as we look at individual industries and we look at what's happened in employment, it really does look like wages are growing faster than inflation for the first time, probably in half a century, uh, and in Buffalo starting a little bit earlier. But you can see that there are some issues here, particularly in Buffalo. If you go down to the bottom and look at food service and accommodations, you're going to see that there's still average salaries of around $25,000 for individuals that are working. And more and more, what we're finding is people in food service aren't your teenagers, aren't young people, but when we look at an age profile of that group, that we're having more and more working family uh, individuals who have children that are basically trying to work two or three jobs to make enough money uh, because they're only making uh, $24,000 there. But we're gonna find out some a big success story. You can see here for us, one of the uh, larger salaries is in finance and insurance as an industry. And you're gonna see in a little bit that that's one of the fastest growing industries in Western New York. Uh, if we look at that, we can look at gross domestic product. Let me just explain what that is. Gross domestic product are all the goods and services that we produce in Buffalo, okay? So it's really a measure of how well the economy's doing. Um, and if we look at the industries, you can see as a percentage of our economy, finance has gone in 2001 from 22% of the economy now to 26% of the economy. And you can see it was growing before COVID and it's continuing to grow. Manufacturing on the other hand was 17% of the economy. It's now dipped down to 12%. It's continuing to drop. It's been dropping uh, since the 1990s. But what's interesting is Buffalo is still has a larger percentage of its economy in manufacturing than almost any other city uh, in the country. So that we're seeing that we're still a manufacturing hub in Western New York. It's just not as important as it was to our economy. We've diversified a little bit more. You can see uh, retail trade has stayed steady. Um, and most of the rest of the economy uh, has stayed about the same, give or take a little bit. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens to professional and business services, uh, particularly with a number of the initiatives that individuals are looking at uh, in Western New York. And hopefully that'll be an area that's a high wage uh, growth area for individuals. Um, so GDP doesn't seem to be affected by uh, COVID and this is what economists would expect with the government stepping in so quickly and putting money into people's hands that we were able to keep the economy going. And that's really a very important part of why uh, I think Buffalo is doing so well. You should realize the local governments and education institutions and others still have uh, money that's going to be distributed in projects that they're doing. We also have the Inflation Reduction Act, which did a number of different things, particularly it's doing things in the environment. We have additional funding coming for infrastructure, which all of you should be working with our local elected officials to make sure that Buffalo 
gets its fair share of all that infrastructure money, that we make sure our bridges and our roads are taken care of, uh, and that you know we don't miss out on that opportunity as we go through that. If you look at um, the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, we're not in Ireland, uh, is about, if we want to look at it, about $739 billion that they've essentially spent in one way or another. Most of the, some of that money is going to go to deficit reduction at the federal level, which hopefully will keep interest rates a little bit lower since the government won't have to borrow as much money. And they're spending a lot of money on uh, basically clean air and clean water. And we can see uh, that the University of Buffalo uh, in today's Buffalo News is working on some of the clean water issues. And they've done the, the issue that President Biden talks about all the time with insulin. But on the other hand, they've put some taxes and reformed some uh, other issues to be able uh, to get uh, the deficit down and to have money for investments that we need to make sure that we take uh, care of. One thing I should point out that I didn't in the last slide that's not really there, that I have a real concern about one industry in Western New York, and that's healthcare and hospitals. And the reason I say that is that we're seeing a dramatic decline in employment, and we'll see it in a second, in hospitals and in healthcare. And part of the reason is that we don't have a university hospital like Strong is with the University of Rochester uh, in Rochester or the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland. And more and more, they're encroaching into our market and the money that should be staying in Western New York and the care that should be available to people in Western New York really needs to be thought about. And I know it's a very complex issue and we can talk about that. I think we talked a little bit about it last year when we were here, but it still continues to be an issue and it still be, continues uh, to worry me a little bit as we go through that. Well, what's happened to employment? If we look at employment, when we were at the peak, basically in 2018, we, uh, if we want to look at that uh, last peak that I show you, we had 574,000 jobs. When COVID hit, you saw that dramatic drop in the number of jobs so that we've lo we lost essentially 131,000 jobs uh, uh, in Western New York because of COVID. And then luckily for us, we very quickly on a month to month basis, uh, and this data is month to month, um, we saw that uh, employment went up. And I left the data here in nominal terms. I didn't seasonally adjust it. So you could see just how volatile every year employment is. Uh, and we've worked our way back up to 560,000 jobs, but we're still about 14,000, 13,000 jobs short from where we were at our last peak. But hopefully we're going to continue to grow and get back to that. But you can see from 1990, basically up to about 2015, you know, 2016, that our economy was relatively flat with the number of jobs. We weren't growing the economy in a way that we would have liked to have seen. We were starting to grow right before COVID. We dropped. We now seem to be growing back. The question is, are we going to be on a higher trajectory and grow Buffalo, or are there going to be obstacles in our way if we look at this? Okay. Here's our third polling question. Is your organ uh, experiencing staffing shortages? Uh, 
All right, everyone, I'll just give you a bit longer here to answer this third polling question. Okay, and then I'll share those results with you all. Okay. So you can see that that's an issue. But if you think about it, a couple of things that we don't normally talk about is if you remember at the beginning uh, of my talk, we, we looked and we saw that we lost 4,000 people to COVID. Now, a large number of them were elderly and retired, but there's still, if you talk about having 1,000 or 1,500 people who would have been working who uh, are no longer here because they passed, that can put a big crimp into the program. The other thing that we're seeing um, with employment too in shortages is a number of students who've dropped out of high school and haven't continued, didn't graduate, and for whatever reason, don't seem to be in the labor force. So we're looking at that 18 to 21 age group that should be either in college and working part-time or should have graduated and tried to go into the trades. We don't know where some of those young people are. We're hoping that they come back, particularly uh, at Buffalo State, coming back to Buffalo State in college because we've seen a drop in the number of students since COVID and we're hoping and uh, we're expecting for them to try to come back because if they don't come and get their education, as they move through their lifetime, they can expect to make, in nominal terms, about $4 million less over their lifetime, or about $2 million in today's dollars than they would have. And that's gonna have implications for people buying houses, people having children, people being able to enjoy uh, life. So we're looking at these problems and we need to have both education, government and business get together to try to solve some of these problems. Uh, and quite frankly, for all of you that are hiring, what we're seeing with a number of our students is that because of COVID, they don't have the same stamina that they did to go to class. Um, so in this last two weeks of class in the semester, a lot of them you can see are putting their heads down on the desk. They're not used to coming to class and physically concentrating because I think with the Zoom, they didn't concentrate as much. Now that they're here in class and they're having to concentrate more, that they're not physically um, exercised enough in that skill to be able to do it. And so we're working on that and we're trying to make sure that uh, they get back up to where they're gonna be good employees. But I, I think you can start to see some of that with younger folks. And part of that is just trying to adjust uh, to COVID as we go through all of this. Um, here's uh, an example of non-farm employment. I already showed you that for Western New York. I wanted to show it to you in New York State. You can see that New York State from 2010, while we were growing a little bit faster, New York State grew a lot faster. And we dropped uh, about the same as New York State, but they still didn't drop that many jobs in New York State, particularly in New York City. And if we look at, we're about 2% below where we were and New York City and New York State is about 2% below where they were. So New York State, unlike the rest of the country, is still lagging in job production. Some other states actually have grown past where they were uh, in, um, in employment, uh, but we are just about there and I would suspect that in the next few months, we should be able to be back to where we are and we'll see where we're growing. But we still are lagging a little bit behind the rest of the country. 
Um, where are those jobs? Where are we, where are we lagging? Um, well, some of the, and this is from COVID. Now remember, we grew in finance, um, but since COVID, since November, 2019, we've lost about 3,400 really good paying jobs there, but we gained almost that number in professional and business services, which are paying really good jobs. And if you notice, the top line is the total number of jobs we're down uh, and left uh, to, to recoup. And you can see uh, trade transportability and retail sales and finance and information and going down to government is a lot more than 13,000 jobs. Those were offset by some low paying jobs in food service and hospitality and leisure. So we're looking at about 4,000 jobs in relatively low paying positions. So we've replaced some high paying jobs with low paying jobs. And that's a concern that we're going to have to see. But the good news, and I think the really good news, particularly with the UAW signing their contract, is that manufacturing is starting to grow again. And if you remember before, that was becoming a smaller part of our economy, but it's starting to grow uh, as we go through all of that. Okay. Um, so the economy is mostly recovered. We're not quite back there yet. But all in all, we've weathered the storm except for last year's storm. That's my one joke for the place as we go. But I wanted you to think about some things. Why do so many people think the economy is bad? Is it high mortgage rates? Where interestingly enough, if we talk about that, most people in Western New York had locked in their mortgages, so they're not paying high mortgage rates. It's only if you're buying a new house. So why are that? Is that the one of the issues that people are worrying about? Was it the increase in gas prices that have dropped dramatically? Is it inflation that we think is higher? Is it politics that we're just so much more polarized? So whoever is in office, the other side just says the world is a terrible place and we can't do it. Is it the stock market? The stock market has grown dramatically through COVID and probably, and if you want to talk about it, probably is overvalued at this point uh, as we go. Or is it something else? And I'll tell you what I think the something else is. Um, back in 2019 and 20, if you were making $50,000 a year and you got an extra because you had two kids, you know, five or $6,000, uh, you felt a lot better uh, about that. And you spent that on things that you were supposed to spend it on. You spent it on food. You made sure you could pay your rent. You bought your children new clothes. You made sure that they had holiday presents. All of those things happened. Well, there is no $6,000 uh, or $5,000 in your account now that's coming this year. So that's a real 10% hit to your real you know, salary and income. And so I think some people are starting to feel that they're not doing a little bit better because they've spent through that money that they were supposed to do. But now the expectation was wages are gonna be back, people's jobs are gonna be back and you should be back on your feet. It was never meant to be a long-term solution but I can see why people might say, gee, I'm not doing quite as well. I was able to buy or not worry so much about buying my kids some new clothes or some new sneakers or something like that. And now I do. And then if you were making a large amount of money, $100,000 or 150, you didn't see any money at 150,000. And if you had $100,000, what we noticed is most people just put that into their savings accounts and didn't notice it. So I think there is a reason for people to feel bad. They probably shouldn't 
If they understood what was going on, maybe they would feel a little bit better about the economy. And hopefully after you've seen some of the numbers I've shown you here today, that Buffalo seems to be going in the right direction. We seem to be growing. The important thing now is not to be down on the economy, to make those investments because we see opportunities and not sort of have the bad press make us stop doing something that would be good for our business, good for Western New York. So uh, thanks very much. Here's your fourth polling question. I'd like to find out which one you think it is uh, and we'll see what everybody says. All right, everyone, I see those answers coming in. Let's make sure that you definitely submit for the polling questions if you are hoping to receive CPE credit for this session. Okay, we'll give it just a second here. I see a few more of you submitting those answers. Okay, and here are our results. Okay. It seems to be, you know, reasonably spread across a number of areas. And I think that may be right too, because different parts of the population are going to have different impacts because of all of this. So the interesting question now is inflation is coming down, unemployment hasn't gone up. Uh, most economists are going to be expecting, because we still haven't seen uh, a recession, um, the joke among economists is that we've been looking for the recession all through 2023, and it's just never shown up, and we're wondering why it's late. And so economists are, are somewhat concerned that it's important uh, for us to have recessions. It's important for us to have downturns because that allows us to make corrections in the economy so that we can grow again. So that while nobody wants to see a business fail, um, having a recession and having weaker businesses fail means workers can go to stronger businesses and new opportunities will be able uh, to come to the fore that are stronger than the businesses that failed. I know that sounds bad, particularly to a, a group of business people, but that's why economics is called the dismal science, is that we look at recessions as not necessarily being bad things, but as part of a process that needs to happen if the economy is gonna to continue to grow, people's real wages are gonna to continue to grow, profits are gonna to continue to grow. So the question is, what's going to happen in the next few months? Is unemployment going to increase? Is the infrastructure um, bill that the Congress passed and the Inflation Reduction Act going to still pump enough projects and money into the economy so that we don't see a recession until 24 or 25? That would be a long time if we think about 2008, 2009, looking at the trough to not have another recession, it would, we are way past the time that we should expect it. And I think that's why folks like Larry Summers and others have been talking about stagflation or recessions. Um, but it, and that's where um, Paul Krugman has talked about not having enough money put into these projects uh, as we go along with it. I would just want to talk one little bit about inflation as we go forward going, you know, there are a number of different reasons for inflation. Uh, one of them is monetary policy and that we had not contracted our monetary policy and we had continued to grow our money supply 
from 2008 on because of the fear of deflation. Because if you remember, interest rates were very low. Prices were very, very low. The CPI was basically close to zero. And that wasn't necessarily considered a good thing. So there was a lot of money pumped into the economy. That money didn't really go anywhere because interest banks weren't able to get uh, a lot of interest from loans at that time. So a lot of that money sat on banks' uh, balance sheets and didn't get into the economy. The question here, we had the, the president of the New York Fed here uh, last spring, and we talked about that uh, at uh, the Birchfield Penny where we had, I don't know, about 200 folks, maybe many of you were there, about the problem of unwinding quantitative easing and how we were going to do that to make sure that we didn't put the economy into a recession. They continue to try to lower the, monet uh, the money supply so that we don't see inflation. But the other reason that there's inflation was because of things that happened in the economy. So we saw egg prices go up and poultry prices go up and pork prices go up simply because of plants being closed down in the Midwest because of salmonella outbreaks and the chicken flu that happened. That meant the supply of those products went dramatically down, therefore raising the price. So what we're seeing is as those uh, plants come back online and that we repopulate the chicken uh, industry, um, that inflation in those areas have gone down. Gas prices went up, not so much because of monetary policy, but because of the hurricanes that knocked down uh, the, uh, the plants that produce uh, and the refineries that produce gasoline. Once they came back online, those prices went down. But we also got used to seeing gas prices at a dollar because nobody was driving anywhere. And so obviously when people started driving again because we stopped being locked down, gas prices went back up. And the reality is gas prices now are actually lower in real terms than they were before COVID. Um, so we're seeing inflation come down. Uh, it still needs to come down more, but unlike uh, our periods of inflation that we've seen in the 70s, where it stayed high for a number of years, it's only been, you know, basically about a year since it was hit its peak at around 10%. So we're starting things to move in the right direction. We need to sit down and think about, well, where do you put your business in this sort of picture that's coming there. Are interest rates going to come down if inflation comes down? Are they going to stay higher? Who's are you is now the time to start to take money and put money into a CD or a savings account because for the first time in 20 years you're able to get interest. That should be very important to people that are going to be retired. So in Western New York, where we have a sizable number of individuals who are over 65, um, they may now have some more additional funds and may be able to buy some more things. Should your business look at some of those things and those opportunities that might happen here in Western New York? So, you know, looking at all of the economists, I have to say, we will predict a, a recession. Uh, probably about six months after the recession has started, and we probably won't tell you about it until after it's ended. So we as economists may not be great predictors of what's going to happen in the economy, but we can talk about what has happened. So I wanted to leave some time for questions. It looks like we have about 10 minutes, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions you all have. Thank you, Fred. Um, in the Q&A box, um, everyone, please feel free to submit those questions in the Q&A box if you have any more. Um, we have one question right now. 
<clears throat> New York State minimum wage increases and federal proposed impacts our ability to hire slash retain workers. We have intentionally reduced staff and services in response. Individual wages are growing, but the number of employees at lower skilled positions are shrinking or being replaced by automation. This affects younger workers trying to enter the workforce, doesn't it? And then they also said this also drives wave, wage compression required to retain mid-level employees. Uh, I think the last point is probably somewhat true that what will happen with raises in minimum wage is um and we'll see that that will trickle up the wage uh gap that goes on there the interesting thing is looking at minimum wage jobs and the number of individuals here and i actually have a presentation that i did in new york city uh about a year ago on this is we looked at this question of whether or not actually minimum wage positions were declining as uh, the minimum wage was raised. And we did a comparison between Western New York and uh, Pennsylvania area where minimum wages didn't go up. And we looked at whether or not employment was growing at a faster rate in Pennsylvania where wages didn't, did they retain workers at a better rate? Um, and were there more um, declines in um, those kinds of uh, companies that were at the lower end that were employing minimum wage workers. And the answer turned out to be no. The answer turned out that actually wages were growing faster in Western New York than they were in comparable places where the minimum wage wasn't going up. And there may be a number of reasons for that. Um, some of it is that um, people at the bottom end now have more money and they were spending money in restaurants and other places that they didn't have to do it. Another problem, and I think the shortage that we can talk to, uh, is that individuals that were making at the minimum wage, and in fact, in Buffalo, very few people were making under $10 an hour. Now the minimum wage is above that. But back then, the minimum people, the minimum wage was below what people were getting. So raising the minimum wage initially didn't have any impact because nobody was being hired at that amount, quite frankly, at all of that. But what is happening with the shrinking workforce is if individuals can work instead of working one job uh they before they were working two or three jobs and now they're able to work one job and have enough money to survive you're not seeing people working those two and three jobs so you are seeing a difficulty in trying to to staff things and to some extent we're seeing some automation but not as much as people predicted um and the interesting thing i think about restaurants i i gave a talk on minimum wage to the round table in syracuse and two restaurant owners came up to me after um, the my my talk about minimum wage and why we didn't see employment go down uh, as much as we expected and everything else. And their response was, well, there's a really good reason why we weren't able to get rid of any of our workers, even though minimum wage went up. And it's because they were all our relatives and our, our brothers and sisters wouldn't have allowed us to fire any of their children. So um, we can see some of that kind of thing going on. The interesting part that I see in restaurants that I think actually is a good thing is that we're seeing a compression of their menus so that there's less waste. They're not having the large 20 page menus that they had where they were storing a lot of inventory and that there was a lot of waste. We're seeing a lot more specials. Uh, we're seeing smaller menus, which actually may be a good thing over time and should have help the profitability of of individuals. Now that may mean that you have a few less uh, workers uh, there, particularly waiters and things like that. Part of that though goes back to my concern of what I'm saying is this lost generation 
of students that seem to have left high school either in 11th or 12th grade and they don't seem to be anywhere and they would be part of that workforce. And there's an estimate in Western New York that I've seen, I didn't do it, but an estimate that we're missing about 40,000 students and young people from about 16 to 22 in the Western New York area. Um, and that may explain some of this. Will Hopefully some of those people will come back and that will help with this shortage. I hope that answered your question. Great. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, if you'd like to log off and hop on to our second session. But before you do, I'd just like to remind you, please complete the survey at the end of this webinar. We really appreciate it. And thank you again, Fred. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening.